Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Father Greg. In this episode, we have a homily for Sunday, November 20th, 2022, in which we celebrate the reign of Christ. Today's homily is grounded in both the reading from Colossians chapter 1, as well as Luke chapter 23. A link to both readings can be found in the notes for this episode. Let's now listen to a reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul writes, May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from Jesus' glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness, and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The Word of the Lord. May I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the TV shows that we often watch in our house is Murdoch Mysteries. It's a police show set in the early 1900s in Toronto. Although it's a police drama, its historical setting means that it's usually pretty family-friendly. Part of the show's charm comes from this historical setting. They talk about things that were new discoveries for that period just over a hundred years ago. Things like x-rays, the motor car, and using a person's finger marks to help solve a crime. Although some of the language may seem outdated, many of the theories still hold true. I thought about Murdoch and his sleuthing skills as I prepared for today. Today, the church around the world celebrates what was originally called Christ the King's Sunday, but now is often referred to as the Reign of Christ Sunday. While there are still some countries that have monarchies, I question whether royalty is as prominent a concept as it once was. But if we take a look at our readings for today, I think they'll have some clues about the true meaning of today's feast day. Our first clue is found in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God. One of the core elements of our Christian faith is that the very person of God is essentially distilled in the person of Jesus Christ. If you know one or see one, you know the other. Two thousand years ago, when Jesus walked the earth, teaching, healing, and feeding people, that wasn't just a phenomenal Israeli religious teacher. Whatever Jesus said or did, or wherever he went, people were encountering God in human form. Paul went on to say that everything that has ever been, or ever will be, came into being through the power of God and through the power of Jesus Christ. They acted as one. Paul also describes Jesus as the head of the church and that in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through Christ God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of Christ's cross. Elsewhere, Paul argued that Christ is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. 
All of this goes to articulate Jesus' identity, not as a prophet or a teacher, but as God walking the earth in human flesh. Without putting too fine a point on it, a proper understanding of Christ's identity is essential to our own identity as members of the Christian faith. For how can we truly consider ourselves to be part of the Christian church, to be followers of Christ, without some understanding of who Jesus is? Our reading from Luke's Gospel further clarifies Paul's concept of Christ's identity. At first blush, as we sit here a few weeks before Christmas, it may seem odd to hear what is normally an Easter reading, but this reading from Luke's Gospel offers an important clue to the kind of kingship that Christ offers. Paul describes Jesus as someone in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and yet Luke also describes Jesus as being put to death by crucifixion. These two facts are not mutually exclusive. The crucifixion does not contradict Jesus' divinity or kingship. Rather, it speaks to what kind of kingdom he was initiating. A reading from Luke's Gospel reminds us that Christ doesn't rule from an earthly throne with ermine fur draped around his shoulders. Rather, his kingship is centered on the cross and a crown of thorns. This is the kind of kingdom that Jesus promoted when he assumed the role of a servant, knelt at his disciples' feet, washed them, and then gave them a new commandment to love each other as he had loved them. This is the same king who told his followers to love your enemies, to do good to those who hate you, to bless those who curse you, and to pray for those who abuse you. That's the kind of culture that we hear about throughout the Gospels when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom that promotes a culture of compassionate service instead of retaliation and compensation for wrongs committed. Jesus was promoting a radically different kind of kingdom, not led through the use of power and dominance, but rather led by a compassionate servant king. So what does all this talk about Christ the King or the reign of Christ have to do with us today? Well, first of all, if we are to consider ourselves to be followers of Christ, it's important for us to know the identity and qualities of the one whom we follow. Are we prepared to participate in the kind of kingdom that he promoted? Is that the kind of culture in which we want to live and move and have our being? These are all important questions because the kingdom that Jesus was promoting is not one that we are simply born into. We have to intentionally choose to take up citizenship in this culture of Christ. When we talk about the reign of Christ, we are talking about Jesus' unique identity as God and the authority that comes with that identity. But we're not just talking about that. We're also talking about Jesus promoting a culture of compassion and radical inclusion that often runs contrary to the culture that we experience in our daily lives. Secondly, we need to ask the question about how we represent this reign of Christ in the world around us. There's a small section in Toronto around Queen and University that houses almost a dozen consulates from around the world. As you pass by, you will see the flags of the home country flying from the front of the building. Each of those consulates represents the interests of their home countries here in Toronto and in Canada. Each consulate employee becomes a representative for his or her home country and culture here in Toronto. Their actions reflect either positively or negatively on the culture that they are representing. This is a great metaphor when we consider the reign of Christ and what he referred to as the kingdom of God. Extending that metaphor a bit, what flag flies on the front of our building and what culture do we represent to the world? As those who claim to be members of Christ's consulate in our wider culture, what does our behavior say about the one that we represent? 
How well do we embody the culture that Christ lived and taught his disciples? How are we living out the mission of the kingdom of God in the culture in which we live? Let's pray. God of unbroken weakness, make us just and righteous people. Keep us faithful to Jesus Christ, crucified and victorious, in whose authority we dare to speak your truth, even in the face of injustice and death. Amen.